By 8 January, the second communist invasion of South Korea is a little over a week old, and UN troops are withdrawing along most of the line. In the center, the important rail and road junction city of Wonju is under heavy attack by Red Forces. Loss of Wonju will seriously imperil the main United Nations southward withdrawal route. To the west, units of the Allied 8th Army fall back from Suwon before stiff pressure by Chinese divisions. The United States Far East Air Force, going into its sixth continuous day of intensive combat effort, is forced to curtail its activity somewhat because of bad weather. United Nations troops in the western sector near Osan dig out from under the heaviest snowfall of the South Korean winter as they await the expected attack by a reported 7,000 Chinese Reds massed between Osan and Seoul to the north. Communist forces in this area have been ominously quiet since they pushed south across the Han River below the former South Korean capital city, following the withdrawal of 8th Army divisions. Minor patrol clashes on the outskirts of Osan, where United States forces made their first stand last summer, have established the presence of enemy forward units in this area, but the main body of Red troops has not yet moved against these snow-blanketed positions. Intelligence reports, however, indicate a building up of enemy strength around Suwon, a few miles north of here, and the soldiers clear away the heavy snow and get ready to defend their area in the event of attack. Meanwhile, to the east, a sharp seesaw battle rages about Wonju, where 16 divisions of Chinese and North Korean troops attempt to force their way down the rugged spine of the Sobek Mountains to outflank the western sector and cut the main supply road to Busan. The United States 2nd Division, with French and Dutch elements, is meeting this threat in force and the fate of Wanju has not yet been decided. These 24th Division soldiers, accustomed to threatening tactical situations and harsh weather conditions, concentrate on hot chow among the snowdrifts. Here at Osan, as the troops stand guard in the snow, the camera catches personal glimpses of the men about whom President Truman recently said, I want to pay tribute to the ground soldier, the men who hold the ground, who fight from the trenches and from the machine gun nests. The president made this statement at a ceremony where he presented the Congressional Medal of Honor to the families of five heroes of the Korean campaign. Here, ground soldiers, without much thought for heroics, stand ready to face whatever may come their way. Fighter bombers are girded for combat on a Korean field as the Air Force steps up its operations to harass and impede the communist aggressors, reportedly massing troops and supplies for an all-out offensive drive toward Busan. A flight of F-80 shooting stars streaks north to attack enemy supply lines in the snow-covered mountains of North Korea. UN air elements during the period of 8 to 15 January are blasting the enemy mercilessly in a determined effort to prevent him from bringing up equipment and collecting troops in sufficient numbers for a major drive. These scenes depict the air war with unusual clarity. After identifying the target, the planes peel off for a rocket attack on the bridge. Direct hits leave the span of flame. The jets wheel about and return for another run to make sure the bridge is destroyed. The cameraman rides in the crowded cockpit of an F-80. level attack raises smoke from an enemy position perched high atop a wooded hill. B-26 light bombers in smooth steady flight attack troop billets in a small town. Air action by United Nations planes in Korea has forced the communists to adopt a limited pattern of supply and troop movement. Transfer of equipment and personnel 
must be accomplished chiefly at night or along narrow mountain trails. Huge losses of men and materiel are suffered by the Reds when their convoys are caught by Allied planes on the open roads. If bivouacked for the day in the protection of towns or villages, they run the risk of further attack as our aircraft send their bombs, rockets, and machine gun bullets against buildings used as shelter by the Reds. As a result of this relentless attrition from the air, plus our superior armor and artillery power, the Reds prefer to remain in the mountains, shun head-on conflict with our forces on the level plains and valleys. This has been advanced by some observers as one reason why the main communist effort is now restricted to the mountainous Wanju sector, and why the Reds have not attempted a full-scale drive south of Seoul on the western coastal plain. Reports from communist prisoners indicate that the incessant air attacks, besides claiming large numbers of casualties, are wreaking havoc with troop morale, particularly among the North Koreans. However, American pilots state that some Chinese groups maintain marching formation on the roads even under strafing attack. Here, a large town is raked with destructive fire by UN aircraft. Coming in at ground scraping altitudes, the speedy jets penetrate the winding valleys of the North Korean landscape, searching out red troops hiding in the many villages. Besides the Lockheed shooting stars and the B-26s, F-84 Thunder Jets, F-86 Sabres, and propeller-driven F-51s are active in close support and interdiction missions. A battalion of the 2nd Division attacking near Wanju on 10 January found that the preparatory airstrike against the enemy's position had inflicted over 1,500 casualties. Air attacks have been found particularly effective when coordinated with artillery bombardments to neutralize enemy strong points before ground troops jump off in the assault. When the battle is underway, planes may shift their attack to blast enemy reserve assembly areas, ammo dumps, and artillery batteries. Here, a napalm firebomb is dumped on communist vehicles. Flying hundreds of sorties by day and night, UN fighters and bombers are sharply reducing the enemy's strength and destroying his will to fight. On 15 January, after a week of bitter fighting, there is a general lull along the 80-mile Korean front. The United States 8th Army's 2nd Division, with French and Dutch units, still holds the line south of Wanju. Red troops are reported messing for a new offensive in two key areas. Four North Korean divisions have been identified in the Yongwal Tongyang Chechon Triangle, east of Wanju. In the west, the Chinese 38th Corps is reported moving down from Seoul to join the Chinese 50th Corps near Suwon. Despite the lull in ground activity, the UN Air Forces continue their heavy pounding of the enemy. At the 10th Station Hospital in Pusan, Korea, an army nurse goes about her merciful task of caring for our wounded. And so the U.S. Army Nurse Corps quietly observes its golden anniversary, continuing the tradition of unfaltering devotion to duty that has characterized 50 years of humanitarian service. Only 10 days after the beginning of hostilities, the first detachment of army nurses arrived in Pusan with the first mobile surgical hospital. Today, field and mobile hospitals, set up in tents or in abandoned buildings near the front, receive casualties from divisional medical units farther forward. Although mobile hospitals are basically 60-bed units, hundreds of patients may be admitted in a single day, and holding wards alone may be crowded with as many as 200 patients. Any man who can be returned to duty in from three to 10 days is treated here so that no needless burdens will be placed on evacuation facilities or on overworked hospitals in the rear. The varied duties and responsibilities of the nurses of the Far East Command constitute a round-the-clock challenge that leaves little time for rest and recreation. 
The job to be done is literally one whose importance is a matter of life or death. Intravenous sets must be made ready for transfusions of plasma and whole blood. Surgical trays must be prepared in advance. Well aware of the significance of their work, these nurses are determined to stick it out until the fighting is over and their job is finished. An autoclave is used to sterilize trays of equipment before the medical instruments go to the operating theater to be placed in the surgeon's hands by a skillfully trained nurse. Struck down by a communist shell while he fought for world order under the banner of the United Nations, this soldier suffered a major wound in his leg and knee. A patient seriously injured, as this man is, must receive immediate surgery and nursing care until the time when his physical condition is such as to make it safe for him to be evacuated by plane or hospital ship. In the more permanent U.S. Army hospitals on the islands of Japan, nurses again must find ways and means to care for more patients, many more patients, than they should reasonably be expected to handle. And this problem of the severe shortage of personnel is not one which applies only to medical installations overseas. According to Colonel Mary G. Phillips, chief U.S. Army nurse, the Army needs 3,000 more nurses in order to properly handle its job. Every hospital in the Army Medical Service is operating today with fewer nurses than the minimum required in proportion to its patient census. Nursing care is one of the most important factors that governs the effectiveness of medical treatment and the speed of a patient's recovery. Many times it is only the kindly and thoughtful attentions of a nurse that can inspire a patient with the indefinable something called the will to live, without which even the so-called miracle drugs can perform few miracles. The Army is taking steps to ensure most effective use of the nurses presently available. Many have already been transferred here to the Far East Command to reinforce the overworked hospital staffs. But this is not the whole answer. The responsibilities placed upon Army nurses and the number of patients which Army nurses are required to care for are increasing week by week. But the number of nurses on duty with the Army is not increasing in equal ratio. New enlistments are essential. Fortunately, the American Nurses Association is cooperating fully to help correct this serious deficiency with minimum disruption to civilian nursing services. The way that Army nurses overseas have been managing to carry on in spite of the difficulties confronting them led Major General Edgar E. Hume chief surgeon of the Far East Command to comment, the members of the Army Nurse Corps have distinguished themselves by their devotion to duty, their utter disregard of working hours, and their willingness to do anything that needs to be done at this time. They have displayed courage, stamina, and determination. They have completed every task with which they have been confronted in a superior manner. A fitting tribute to the Army Nurse Corps, which at the time of its golden anniversary, adds new honors to a long list of praiseworthy achievements. On 29 January, a large part of the United Nations 8th Army is on the offensive after a week of aggressive action resulting in the recapture of many key towns from the enemy. So far, the Communists have failed to launch their expected large-scale attack. During this week, 
Incheon, which has been under heavy naval shell fire, was successfully raided by South Korean commandos. Red counterattacks against UN forces advancing north of Suwon leave the fate of that city in doubt. West of Wonju, a Red Battalion attacking the UN advance units is turned back with heavy losses. UN patrols enter Pyeongchang but withdraw later to defense positions to the south. The Far East Air Force continues to attack communist supply routes and to blast the enemy massing in front of the United Nations advance.